we were touching on anything we wanted. Yeah. Nobody seemed to be <laughs> yeah. like policing yeah. us. We were like talking no. about ritualistic, you know, innards and. Sword of Omens come to my hand. I, Lion O, command it. Thundercats, ho! And you're watching the Dorkening. So, welcome everybody to a look at the Marvel mystical side of comics. And that is sometimes a, a part of the Marvel world that we don't normally think about. Um, as somebody that's a, a big DC guy, but a Marvel kind of on the fringy, it's always been that side that has kind of dragged me in. I just love the looks. I love the stories. I love the supernatural side of things. And we've got three creators here who are going to introduce themselves. And we are going to talk about some great characters, Moon Knight, Ghost Rider, all these characters that have just really turned out to be something a little more than they might have thought when they were created. Um, so welcome everybody and please introduce yourself. Uh, Terry Cavanaugh, I was a Marvel editor for a long time uh, and it was a long time ago and I wrote Moon Knight amongst other titles for Marvel but that's the one I'm here for right now. Uh, Howard Mackey, I was a Marvel editor for exactly seven years. I know how long. Um, and those I, I, numbers. I, I'm not so old that uh, I forgot. And I, I've written a bunch of stuff for Marvel, primarily known for Ghost Rider and Spider-Man. Excellent. I'm Dan Chichester, under the pretentious uh, name of D.G. Chichester. Um, probably best known for Daredevil, but also some Dark Corners, The Midnight Suns with... Howard I was an editor on Marvel for a number of years, and, uh, and Epic Comics and Night Stalkers was the big title in the Midnight Suns run. There's a lot of history up here, and that's awesome, so thank you guys for coming. There is a microphone over here, so this is your panel, and I will be asking questions until somebody comes up and asks them, and when I start getting to what's your favorite color, you need to start coming up to get questions up here, so if you have any questions, please don't be shy. Um, but let's start this off. I want to go back to Moon Knight. Uh, Moon Knight was a character that when, in the 1970s, when I first heard of him and that he was in a magazine that I couldn't buy because I, my parents wouldn't let me buy the magazines. It was just the comics. Um, Moon Knight, to me, was always that character that I felt should just be like a dirtier Batman. Like, he was Batman, but he's, he's doing the stuff that he shouldn't be doing. And I'm curious as to what were your thoughts of the character because he's not anything like... Anytime any writer takes him, he seems to go on some completely different direction. Like, we're going to really deal with the psychosis of the character. We're going to deal with his, you know, with his past, things like that. So for you guys, what do you think it is about that character that makes him strong or what you think he should be? Well, for me, he was Marvel's Batman, and Batman was my favorite character. So that was a lot of fun for me. When I was writing the book, uh, there was a mandate not to touch on the different psychotic personalities of his. And there was a request to move him into a more supernatural realm. He had sort of been introduced in Werewolf by Night, mm -hmm. so he was of that uh, branch of comics, that genre, but they had moved him away from that. So there was a request to move him more into that, which is why I created the Hellbent, which was supposed to be a species of uh, underground and underground species of people that were descended from both demons and angels so they were they were both weren't really allowed to say angels at that point because that implied a very specific religious heaven but so that's how i sort of played it i didn't want to just abandon how he had been played but to move him into that supernatural thing that's how why i introduced the hell there yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I forgot until just now. I actually wrote Moon Knight. Sorry, did you, you wrote more than one? You wrote, did I? Right before I came on the book. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I guess I, I am old. That, I these are so know. much fun when you do these things. Wait, yeah. I did that? I don't yeah. remember that. I, I think you wrote it for like a year. No, you definitely did not. I you definitely. Wrote a number of issues. I, I, right okay, I well, we on. can Google this after. But oh, what you happened? Don't have to did you get I, paid right. for those issues? <laughs> oh, 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 trust me, I, I always made sure I got paid. I may not remember many things. But. I, know, I, I had to pick up your dangling plot threads. I beg your pardon. <laughs> Keep your hands off my dangling plot to, threads. I had to pick them up. But I came in. I was asked to do at least one issue uh, right after uh, uh, J.M. Dematis uh, did his his run, and. He did a, a wonderful story, and with, but as is Mark's uh, bent, 
he tends to go in a certain direction. And there was a lot more, uh, rather than mysticism, there was more spirituality and mm -hmm. Moon Knight getting to a point where he thought he didn't want to be too violent anymore. He wanted to become a passive spirit of vengeance. And um, he, 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 you know, he was not, he was only going to use Aikido to, you know, he wasn't going to punch anybody and all that. Anyway, the editor came to me and said, Howard, we, we have a big issue coming up. It's issue 25. Will you uh, write it? And I said, well, I've been reading what Mark did, and it's really not my strong suit. So he said, nope, doesn't matter. You know, <laughs> you just, you know, do. You just, so essentially, my issue number 25 said to Mark's very nice run, nah, never mind. And, you know, so my, and my approach was much more. Uh, I, I thought of him as you you suggested more mm. of a uh, of, of Marvel's Batman. Uh, that's just, I mean, it's very much there. Yeah, uh, all of the Batman stuff. I guess would you know you bring a little Raza Ghoul in uh, would have been cool too. But anyway, did you ever do any? I never wrote the character, but enjoyed what these guys did. So there's my <laughs> there's my contribution to this conversation. Thank you. <laughs> and when we look at Moon Knight, um, I was excited about the when they put the series out they did a really good series did you guys watch that enjoy that and i thought because when you're reading the comics sometimes you can get lost in the forty-five thousand different personalities that mark specter has and sometimes you're reading and i mean i i read for enjoyment i read to get entertained and all of a sudden i'm reading something and i'm like wait a minute i forgot which personality he is in right now why is he driving a cab i don't know what's going on I think with the show, they did such a great job with it that I think it really helped visualize the psychosis and then kind of make you understand a little bit more because I went back and started reading things going, I get it a little bit better now. And what, did, what were your thoughts of the show? I, I loved the series. I really did. I thought the visual depiction of Moon Knight was great. Uh, I thought he, whatever, I, something Isaac, I can't remember the actor's name. F. Murray Abraham. Yeah, I think he did that something like that. <laughs> I think he did a great job, and I think they were really smart to go back to the split personality aspects of it because that's what really made Moon Knight different from other characters. Yeah. I mean, he was crazy, and if you break it down, all superheroes are a little crazy. That's the sort of crazy thing to do to dress up in spandex and go to the worst neighborhoods <laughs> at night and punch people. Well, not for you. Or maybe. cosplay. <laughs> Maybe not for you, but... <laughs> so what about for Moon Knight for you guys? Did you watch the series? And I, I, ha I have not seen yeah, it. Yeah, I no. agree with Terry. It was phenomenally well done. I mean, it was just... Uh, well, you guys all saw it, right? You know, a little dicey on some of the special effects, but, uh, yeah. but uh, the psychosis, uh, the split personality, the questioning himself, I think, made you also question some things in the audience. So uh, really spot on. And, and the thing with Moon Knight, too, is I think he... He was more fascinating as a character in the 70s because this was sort of an unknown thing. Like, mm. people didn't talk about feelings and emotions back then. And I remember reading this going, this guy's weird. He's all, like, different things going on, and he's hearing voices. And then as we've gotten older, our, our you know, sphere of influences have grown. We get to know more people. We start realizing that we know more people that are like that than not like that. And do you think... Maybe Moon Knight, it's like more of a, of a, I don't want to say a champion of the people today, but do you think that this might be, he's something that is more represented now than maybe back then? Or understood better, I should say. Well, mental health is certainly more of an issue, mm -hmm. and it's more on the table. So, yeah, I, I do think, yes. You? I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I like when he hits people. <laughs> I, it's an opportunity, right? I mean, when you've got a character that has literally multi-dimensions to him, I think as creators, um, you get a chance to play with a lot more than just, you know, I, was, I must avenge this. You've got all those different levels to play with, and probably as readers, you get the same level of en enjoyment where you get to open it up uh, and not really knowing what's going to happen next, and that's maybe more exciting than, okay, I exactly know where this is going to go, even Mark's run, like you were saying, might have been more spiritual in mm -hmm. some ways. That's the opportunity with a character like that. A lot harder lift with other things 
to kind of explore. I, I was disappointed that I wasn't really allowed to touch on. Yeah, that, I would that. think I, I'm 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 Just, surprised to hear that. Yeah, I mean, that you were kind well, of I mean, told. You didn't touch on it in your one issue. <laughs> I'm googling it. <laughs> <laughs> And when you think about those characters, the, the ones that are on the supernatural side, I, they were always on the fringe side of the Marvel world. Like when I think mm -hmm. of Ghost Rider, I never saw very many ads for Ghost Rider. I know, I, I know. I never saw... You wrote a couple of issues. <laughs> Multitask. Oh, that, oh, we took your phone away? Is yeah. That... yeah. <laughs> Thanks, I have Dad. to do that a lot. Yeah. I have to do that a I lot. Have, uh, I, I didn't know anything about Ghost Rider because there were never any ads for him. You never saw a lot about it. And... You know, you think about back in the old days, in the 70s, when I was a young reader, I didn't discover Ghost Rider until I went to 7-Eleven and bought a Slurpee cup that had Ghost Rider on it. And I got that cup. That's how I discovered Howard the Duck. I was like, what are these things? There was a Ghost Rider Slurpee cup? Yeah. <laughs> Is that hysterical? what they called you? Howard the Duck? Oh, yeah, no, it's a different oh, yeah, no, I get that a lot. Did you get any money for that Slurpee cup? No, he, he said this was in the... This is the 70s. 70s. Oh, 70s. Yes. Oh, yeah, the original. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you had all these things, and... and for me, that's how I discovered him. And when you look at somebody like Ghost Rider, what a look. That is, an icon that is one of the most iconic looks you can imagine. And whatever your thoughts of, of the Ghost Rider movie that came out of the two, it's the look. I mean, that movie could be so horrible, and I'm not going to make any opinions here or there. But all of a sudden, you, if you're watching the movie, you're like, oh, this is not, oh my God, that's Flaming Skull. And look at the chains. It, it brings it right out. So as far as the visuals of Ghost Rider or you know, writing him and, or drawing or any of those things that you were involved in with the character, what was it that you think made it so magical? Well, I, yes, it was uh, obviously, I was a Ghost Rider fan uh, before I start, got the assignment. And ironically, given the beginning of this uh, discussion, I basically took over Ghost Rider after Mark DeMattis finished his, <laughs> his, his run. <laughs> and I was a huge fan of his run using Johnny Blaze. And I was certainly attracted to the, the visuals to begin with. And I, I mean, I, it's, I, I agree with you. I think it's, it's one of the best visuals for a character in the Marvel Universe. I may be uh, somewhat prejudiced about oh, that. It's fine. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I like yesterday, uh, uh, a young man came to my table and he had said he had never read Ghost Rider, but he had collected the comics because he thought it looked really mm. cool. Wow. And then recently he decided to read the comics and he's, those are really good stories. <laughs> and I, well, I said, thank you. Um, but it's, it is that. I mean, I think the hook with Ghost Rider is the flaming skull Flaming Skull Demon riding a motorcycle. I mean, I, it's it's right there. weren't weren't skulls and flames two of Julie Schwartz's cover things that if you put a skull or <laughs> flames on the covers, yeah, and a gorilla. He was always a gorilla. It was a gorilla, gorilla a question mark to make you go, yeah. hmm, what yeah. am I supposed yes. to be reading? I thought skulls and flames, not necessarily together. Were part uh, of it well, part. I mean, I think, as, a, as, skull. as you know, when, you know the, <laughs> the, the Midnight Suns was born because after Ghost Rider uh, came out, it, or the second run that I did came out, it became very popular and was a bit of a sales uh, sensation and then the character the flaming skull appeared on the cover of just about every comic mm -hmm. marvel did yeah. at that point and it did it boosted sales and everything and that eventually led to our our experience in the midnight, the midnight Suns. Suns. and calling that the dark side of the marvel yeah. universe <laughs> in many ways you look like you have a question there and you're eagerly anticipating getting to the microphone I my first experience was coming to a comic book shop and seeing Cover 15, Texera, Blowing Skull, and I was a horror fan, and so Ghost Rider is the reason I became a comic nerd 30-some years ago, <laughs> and I love you. Um, <laughs> but you were saying that you'd based it off of, you've been reading the Johnny Blaze before, yeah. and then, but Dan Ketch seemed to be perfect for me. It had a different, I'm not sure if I'd started with Johnny Blaze, I'd go the same way. But then you guys did the Amazing Spirits events, which you were also obviously with the Midnight Suns, my first ever comic book event. Wow, type of that's thing. amazing. So I'd had a harder work ethic. I had to go to, I worked next to the comic book shop, like a mall away. And so I'd be like, I gotta put in extra shifts because I have to buy all these books because I gotta <laughs> keep up with what's going on. And it was so amazing back then. But how, 
did you have all of that planned from the beginning? Oh, absolutely. Or? Every step of the way, that's the <laughs> way it works. Like, He's sarcastic, so and I'm <laughs> snarky. Look, I, he I mean, said that with <laughs> such a straight face. <laughs> you, you ask, not always, but in this case, um, that is a good story. I mean, <laughs> we, we knew nothing of what we were going to do. No. We, we knew we were going to build a dark side of the Marvel Universe based off of Ghost Rider. And they, had, they, they were flush with cash at that point, and they, they put us up for two or three days in a convention center. Me, Howard, Chris Cooper, um, Len Kaminsky. Is that it? Is that, is that all of us? Bobby. Bo well, yeah. Bobby. I would say yeah. Bobby. Bobby Chase, the editor. And, um, yeah. and we literally mapped out this whole thing from there. We knew the characters that there were going to be. We knew it was going to be Morbius, it was going to be Ghost Rider, the, the characters of the Night Stalkers. Chris had the Darkhold idea. We had no idea how they connected together. And so it was two days of very intense going back and forth and these moments of epiphany of like, wait a minute, that'll work. And, um, and I had a stack of occult books about this high uh, that we would refer to. And then Len would go and do a ritual every now and again and would come back with an amazing solution to something. Um, and we did actually walk away from that feeling like we actually had yeah, and I, I was a story. hundred percent behind it from Yeah, the he was he was the worst cheerleader I, on the I, planet. He I, hated I, it. I, Until about midway through. You started Well no, I mean I, I was as I've explained to Dan, I, I went into that meeting feeling petulant at best because I His hair was dark before he we went into that meeting. <laughs> yes. I when when I when I launched when when they came to me to do Ghost Rider and I really wanted to write Blaze quite frankly. Oh. And I was told I couldn't. Um, they wanted a new character, so I created Dan Catch, who was basically me. That, that, I mean, there's very little originality there. Uh, Dan, Dan, Dan Catch was me, um, including the cemetery, where he, I, I, I hung out in that cemetery all the time. Awesome. But it would, it, nobody expected the series to succeed when, when we started. As a matter of fact, sales tried to kill it. Um, because, well, and, and in their defense, it was a previously failed character written by a relatively unknown writer, myself, and with two unknown artists. And really, it, they, they tried to kill it. And then, then it became successful, and he was appearing all over the place. And suddenly they said, so now we're going to do this, this new series, or this this." What are we imprint? Mm -hmm. um, Blind and, and family. Yes, yes, and you're gonna have to play with everybody else. Up until that point, I just did my my own thing, and I came in not in a good mood to this meeting because I really didn't want to do it. And I knew everybody, and I was friends with everybody, but I have such a distinct memory of the visual, and I've described I, this to you. I, and I always and, forget that, but yes, it's we, true. We were in a You're... conference room, and there was a bank of windows with radiators underneath with radiator covers, and everybody was sitting around the, the table except for me. I was, I was on the radiator covers staring out the window as everybody is trying to come up with ideas. What a and, baby. Oh, absolutely. I'm, this is not a proud a moment I'm talking about. And then Dan came up, you mentioned, um, well, we could do something with, with Lilith, the, you know, the, the, the first the original wife of, Adam, uh, of right. Adam. And I, I was aware of that, and it was like light bulb moment for me. And I, I spun my head around, and I said, wait, what? And all of a sudden, I went from being the petulant little child that I was, and I moved to the table, and that's when we really started. Right. He said uh, that was like a half-baked, maybe possibly good idea. I don't want Dan to take credit for it. So he quickly moved, <laughs> pushed me aside, <laughs> then erased what I had written Lilith on the board, and he wrote Lilith on the board. So then... No, well, that's why I'm saying in a public forum, it was, it was you that, that provided the key. To, to get you to, off the radiator. But get me off the radiator. Not necessarily a good really line of books, but to get him off the radiator. A, so, yeah, so, and I was, I was very pleased. Plus, as a result of that, I mean, kind of the, um, um, uh, you know, they, they, they tried to assuage me by allowing me to do Spirits of Vengeance as well, which meant I got to focus on Blaze, which is what I had wanted to do in you the first some place. really fun, happy banter in that. I was, that was wonderful. I went back, I just reread the entire thing before I came here, and so oh, I'm like, awesome. you know, you got the spread of comics everywhere, so I'm like, oh, hey, but then I have to look over here because <laughs> this one, and, well, I know it continues on in this, but I have to read it. <laughs> Which, well, thank you. Yes, but thank you. Thank very you very much. much.
By that point, were you guys able to touch on angels and any kind of... We were touching on anything we wanted. Yeah. Nobody seemed to be <laughs> yeah. like policing yeah. us. That's we were like talking no. about ritualistic, no. you know, innards and bizarro, uh -huh. you know, what, use... What do we call it? Um, well, no, there, there, there didn't seem to be any restrictions about horror or anything like that, but... Or, and even demons were okay. I mean, we had Son of Satan as a comic book right. around before that, but I just remember that angels were all but that even been, when I was doing Marvel Comics Presents. Could that have come from your editor versus no, that came ESC? From Mark Grunewald. Really? Really? Yeah. That surprises me. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, we, I don't remember us having a lot of restrictions. As a matter of fact, and I've told you this story too, years uh, later, about probably about 10 years ago, I got contacted by a um oh that's right a, a, yeah, a yeah, college yeah. professor mm -hmm. who was a rabbi and he he taught religious studies and he was doing a white paper with his son who and it was about um uh, the the use of uh hebraic um lore mm -hmm. in popular culture specifically comic books and he wanted to talk to me about lilith and i thought i i think i had recommended that he talk to you as well but he, he said, so how did you guys know all of this stuff? Where did you, you know, um, you, know you were so close to, you know, the, the, the Samaria or whatever, Aramaic, you know, of Babylonian. So close to opening you know, the Book of the Dead. Yes. You almost conjured demons and on earth. I, he said, and there was really only one text at the time that went into the detail that you guys touched upon. And, you know, but it was, nobody had it. It was just college level stuff for, you know, for, for scholars. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, we're comic book writers. <laughs> I said, we, all, all we know is a little bit of a lot of things. And then we, I said, so anything you think we did intentionally, we made up. And he said, absolutely impossible. You could not have made this stuff. And he started, I said, I, I, you know, Rabbi, I'm telling you, this this is really what we did, and he just he just could not believe it. That's why I think I recommended. I said, I'm sure Dan had some some <laughs> book <laughs> there, and we had all Tome. spoke. You know, we we I mean, it was you know horror and the occult were things that we we were all somewhat interested in. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been doing what we were doing. But I said, no, we just it was just little bits of piece and pieces from all over the place that we turned into something else and he absolutely impossible <laughs> and, and again please the microphone is open if anybody has any questions um, please come over and don't feel shy because that's why we're all here we're here to to find out more and to to pick the brains of the the creators of these 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 events in these worlds and one thing that i remember um marvel and i cannot remember the year i'm gonna say it was probably 1997 98 um there was a four issue series called the supernaturals. And I don't know if you guys remembered that one at oh, all, no. but it almost, and, and the thing that I loved about, there we go. <laughs> we'll let you look that one up. Google. Um, no, no. But one of the cool things about it was it was, it was like a lot of the fringe fringe guys, um, like voodoo, uh, the voodoo Brother master voodoo. was that, or yeah. And, and it had um, son of Satan in it. And the way they prefaced it was they talked about a thing called the chaos event. And you didn't know anything about it. Like all the superheroes were gone and it was the mystical characters that had to kind of take over and try to set the world right and get everybody back. And you guys don't know anything about yeah, that. So I guess know. we're just going to move on we, to another we've question. We forgot about that because the, the chaos event closed. Right. And no, it was wasn't. One of the Max ones that was done under Casada. It wasn't a Max. And the interesting thing too was that each, each issue came with a mask. So you had like a cardboard mask where you could cut out the eyes and you could be, you know. Wow, it's a pretty you know, cool giveaway. It's, um, it sounds like a good concept. It was great. It was good. <laughs> so Sounds like the time when Marvel was publishing too much. Yeah. <laughs> this, this, I think, was almost at the time when they were trying to, they were cutting back, but they were like, okay, let's dip our foot into this side of it. Mm -hmm. You know, when you talk about these characters, I think a lot of the things that I love about team ups and you know having groups of of characters together is the not the fact that they get to go fight crime together and save the world but you have to have these dynamics that all have to get along and when you think about characters like moon knight who's an absolute loner yet he's 25 different people and you've got um, ghost rider is tormented and all these characters teaming them up to always seem to be just like the right thing to do and and as far as 
anything now, what would you like to see as far as maybe a supernatural side team up as far as characters that were in there and maybe some storylines? And I'm not asking for like these huge pitches, but in your head, have you always had like, this is kind of the story I'd like to tell? I mean, I don't know that I have a particular story, but I mean, I think the supernatural characters in Marvel are really interesting. You know, they play with classics. They've got some really original characters as well. I think it's a tricky balance, you, you know, creating with some things. I mean, I always maintained, I felt the mistake we made with the Midnight Suns stuff ultimately was it went too dark. We sort of indulged our worst tendencies to, to really dark things. The, the trick, I think, in playing within a larger shared universe, like a Marvel, uh, even with supernatural characters, is to make sure that you continue to bring the relatability back. You know, it's really easy to kind of go down this grisly path, right. um, which could be really interesting if you're just writing a pure play, Clive Barker, you know, Stephen King type of thing, but you have to find that relatability, you know, back to it. So and usually you do that through normal humans yes. interacting within there. I yes. mean, that's what the Tomb of Dracula stuff by Marv, right. Marv and mm -hmm. Gene Colan good, good way back example. when were brilliant because mm -hmm. it was really just around the people right. around right. Dracula. And, and that was really, when, when I launched Ghost Rider, I never thought of it as a supernatural book. Mm -hmm. It was, I always considered Ghost Rider to be a character that existed on the very dark edges Mm -hmm. of the Marvel Universe, and that's why in the, in the first year, he, all of his, I mean, he, he was going up against super-powered uh, characters, he was going up against mutants and all that, and I, re I always felt it was important that he be the mm -hmm. primary supernatural mm -hmm. element mm -hmm. in the book, and to your point, as much as I've reread some of the Midnight Suns stuff, and I, I've enjoyed it, in, including my own stuff, which I never say, um, that I have enjoyed, but that is the problem right. with it is we we fell into all supernatural all the time. And I think it was probably easier for you and I to to um, kind of you know, walk that edge mm -hmm. with our, our particular set of characters than something you know, like Darkhold. Was which, all, that's the whole it, that's point. That's it. Yeah. yeah. It, it is just, it is a supernatural book. And I, I, I think that was was a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, you know, like I said, I, I, there was a lot of fun that I had, no, had a lot while, of while doing it. But I think, Terry, your point in, you know, in any sort of new book or new idea using characters like that, they might almost, ben the book would almost benefit from those characters being the touch points for some yes. other mm -hmm. human characters, right. you know, like the Tomb of Dracula, yes. versus making the book purely about um, Blade. You know, mm -hmm. or, right. You or, have to have someone you know. for the audience to right. identify yeah. right. with. Right. And like you were saying about going too dark, I tend to think when I think too dark, I think of the DC cinematic universe. That it seemed like once they made some dark movies, everybody was going to be dark. Even Superman. The Superman yeah. movies have been very dark. And to me, Batman should be dark. It should be a dark movie because that's the character. Superman should be the light in the dark. If you're going to make a dark movie, you can't make the character dark he mm -hmm. has to be the light that sort of does it and it was really interesting when you said that because you don't you know to me it seems like in a lot of things it's either all or nothing like we're gonna make the whole marvel universe dark no just have that little pocket i mean mm -hmm. as kids as a kid reader i could always separate those things it might have been easier back then but it was like okay here's ghost rider he lives here he's fighting this big eye was that the orb the orb, the orb. and i'm like this is the dumbest thing i ever saw but oh my or god this thing is carry not in my ghost Rider. i orb. remember i did it in uh, uh solo avengers it was or the versus <laughs> okay and this was and it was stuff like you could separate it they all had their own little world and and you know if like Ghost Rider drove through New York and saw Spider-Man to me. It's like, okay, well, there they are. They're kind of together. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't, the dark didn't get dragged in. It, it, and it's about the contrasts. And that's the problem is that there's nothing unique when you have Ghost Rider going to hell and fighting a bunch of demons. Then it's demon for, it, it's the equivalent of, um, you know, Ant-Man fighting a bunch of miniature um, aliens. Yeah. And he's just a guy fighting another another a bunch of other guys <laughs> and i just i i think the and that's something that i feel has gotten uh, marvel sometimes has lost sight of quite frankly is that 
I, I, I actually have not read a lot of, I don't, I, my policies, I don't read a character after I'm done writing it because I, I, I don't ever want to be able to specifically criticize it. <laughs> <laughs> so I will just genuinely, you could, genuinely. You could sometimes compliment it. You, yeah. you could criticize if you liked it. Oh. That would be the key. Well, it would have to be <laughs> compliment. It would have to worthy. be written by you. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, but how's that, oh. how's that new Ghostwriter series? It's pretty good. I, right? I, I, I don't know. I haven't yeah. read it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just think it, it's the contrast that that is important, and that's you know again when we went so deep down the yeah we you know went and down the I mean, Lilith was a cool character and a bunch of the other. Uh, you know, her, mm -hmm. her Lillian were as well. Right, but that uh, allowed you to kind of dive deeper. Yes. Yeah. You, you're back. I'm back. I, nobody else was here, so I think you had a couple The microphone is yours. Great. All right, so you were talking about uh, being so spot on with the research of Lilith that you just made up entirely, which yeah, was great. Well, I, I did have some pretty dark books in, in, in Old Defense. Yeah, so. yeah. But that's okay. Yeah. You guys can be as dark as you want to be. Um, but what is it like now? Because when I, I, this was the first other experience that I had with the comic that was terrible. Was I, well, this was terrible. Your comic was great. But I took in a copy of one of the Dark Holds to one of my instructors in mm -hmm. school to be like, what is this Latin? Can you translate this for me? Because we didn't have the internet at that point. And so he pulls out a pen and starts writing across the comic, exactly translating things from the pages of the Dark Hole. I'm like, okay, I'll just buy that <laughs> again then. But how, how much do you guys think it has helped to change going from like, God, I have to go and look at these encyclopedias and I have to run over here and do all this to where suddenly we have the internet now and I mean, you have to fact check, but has it been a big change in how you write things? Has it made things a lot easier? Um, absolutely. I, I, I find, I mean, it saves the bank account, right? You don't have to let go and find these fringe books and, and buy them that much. I think you can validate stuff quicker, at least for myself. I find, you know, I want to explore an idea uh, look up something around it, dive deeper on it, and I can sometimes find out that's not a path worth going down. Um, but um, it's actually allowed me now, I think, to equalize. Because I can get more information, I can then dismiss more. Uh, sometimes I felt like I'd spent so much time researching one particular thing that I absolutely had to use it. Y you know, like I put all the time in, I've got to bring in this fringe thing here, but it's actually a distraction of the story. So now I find if I get it all, I can pick and choose a lot easier. I think sometimes it can curb your creativity hmm. a little bit as well. There are some writers, I don't want to name them, I'm not sure I Damn. could, that I find, nobody here, <laughs> that, that I find they're not doing particularly creative comic books. They're just taking little historic moments mm -hmm. and then turning those into stories. And they're expanding on that and adding something fantastical to it, but they're not really generating it from themselves, which is okay. You can do that sometimes. I've certainly done that, but there's a couple of writers I've noticed that's all they seem to do. Hmm. So. I, I, I I prefer the old days when we could just make stuff up. Right. Um, and it, it, that speaks to your point, because I sometimes, I do go down those rabbit holes of, mm -hmm. you know, doing too much research online. And it, it, part of it is you have to do it a little bit more now, because mm -hmm. you all have the same access to the research that we do. So we want to make sure we get as close to it as, as possible. But I think there's a point at which you just have to, you know, get cr creative. With, with it back, whereas it, back in the old days, like I said, we could make stuff up and nobody really knew whether we knew it or not. And I mean, I mean you know, you had some of, you know, more of the weird books <laughs> than, than I did. So I'm hopefully you were fact checking some of our stuff. Like, what was it that we call when, when Lilith, you know, scrying, right? Yes, she, right. The, yeah. the, the, uh, well, the, the Leviathan. Reading, and, reading the entrails. The and, uh, Len was particularly well, that, taken with that. That yeah. was really cool. Yeah. I think that was your idea as well. Uh, so, sure. Now, before you sit down, do you got any more? Because this, this is obviously is a, is a huge panel for you, so please ask away. I'm going insane with this panel, but I, I want to say... <laughs> because they're making no sense. <laughs> what are they talking about? <laughs> Uh oh, somebody's getting up. They'll leave. I thought they're getting up to ask a question. That's okay. But you come back. You come back if you have anything else. Oh, I may have a question. Oh, no, the long walk. 
Hello. And please, anybody, if you have to go to the mic, don't take the long, just cut right across. <laughs> um, my question is more of a writing question. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I find is that sometimes I struggle with character intention. So I come up with a really good idea, but then the character intention gets sort of blurry. How do you keep the character intention and integrity over time? Um, I know it's a loaded question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, um, are you talking about like a character you've created, like something new or just any character that you might uh, want to be character, working with? Characters in general. I always find that if you've invested yourself to a certain degree with a character, if, if you've done it, you're going to struggle with plot points, you're going to struggle with like certain things that way, but if, if you find you're fighting the character, like mm -hmm. you're trying to insert words in her or his mouth and push them into certain ways, you know you're going in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. You know, very often in the best things, things I think are okay, you know, it will be that you're being led by them more and they start to kind of write themselves. So I think it's kind of a flow state mm -hmm. as a writer that you get into, especially if you spent a little bit of time with something in that regard. I agree, especially with continued character storytelling like we do. I sort of start from character intention and then look for story to attach to that, not the other way around. Uh, and I mean, the advantage we had with working with established characters is much of that has been handed to us over years of continuity. Mm -hmm. So, and, and slightly different. Now, I, I, I got to work with both Peter Parker, who had a long history, and then Dan Ketch, who did not. But in both cases, what I was always looking for was commonality between myself and mm -hmm. the characters. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and quite frankly, what would, would my intention then be there? Now, it's obviously, I, you know, on rare occasions does my head burst into flames, <laughs> my skin melt off, but... Well, you like to crouch on rooftops in the rain a lot. Like, I do. <laughs> I do, yeah. indeed, yes. I mean, everyone likes to do that every yeah. once yeah. in a while. Yeah, come on. <laughs> but no, it's, it's about finding, you know, for me, it's about finding the commonality mm -hmm. with the character. And it's, you know, sometimes the characters are, quite frankly, too much like me. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, you have to, to step back. And then, you know, beyond intention, it's, you know, they, they start, and because I've spoken to you about this, where one point early on in my, my career, I was doing Ghost Rider, um, Spider-Man, and I was doing a, a Havoc uh, series for you from, from Marvel, Marvel Comics, Comics Presents. Presents yeah. and at one point, I got all three copies, and I did one of, on rare occasions, started reading them all, and I went, oh my God, all three <laughs> characters sound exactly alike. And I, I, that's when I realized I had to to back off mm -hmm. a little bit and work on my <laughs> developing my writing skills a little bit more to, to figure some of this stuff out. I had the opposite problem. I turned in a Daredevil plot once and Ralph Macchio, the editor, called me up and said, this is in Hellraiser. Go back and redo it. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so I, got, I got a little confused on intention and motivation there. So do you, do you find these, these things you're already thinking about or is this helpful to you? Uh, I, I have some pieces that I've been working on, I do fiction writing, so I have some good plots, but some of the, I find I struggle with villains. Mm -hmm. They tend to have problems with intention, so I have trouble deciding the direction they should go in. So that's the thing that I keep running into. Believe in the villain as much as you believe in the hero. Mm -hmm. I mean, if but that's not, that's not, I know, it's not an epiphany, right? Boom, but no. but I mean, no, it's true. I mean, you just, if you believe in the hero, and that's, you know your jam at the moment mm -hmm. but if you take the role of the villain as much then you know they become a joy to sort of work through their situations and then they're not a plot device their intention is becomes clear to you because you've you've role played and and find something positive in their villainous intent quite frankly because <laughs> they, they don't your villains should never think of themselves as you know villains <laughs> right <laughs> you know what 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 they're doing should should their intention <laughs> intent should be positive to them mm. now the means are more more often than not the, where the, the villainy comes in yeah, as we always say dr doom doesn't wake up in the morning and say what evil thing can i do to, today <laughs> mm -hmm. he thinks the world would be better off if he were running it mm -hmm. there there'd be less starvation less war yeah. 
less turmoil in general, yeah. and that's a motivating factor. Yeah. Oddly enough, I do wake up every morning. I uh, say, so what do you think? Can I do clinics? So. Sometimes I even get an email to that effect. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's fantastic. Thank you all so much. Absolutely. Yeah. Hi, I just have a couple of questions. Um, first off, um, did uh, the, the whole Midnight Sun saga end, end the way you wanted it to, or did it, uh, did it kind of fizzle out with all the craziness at Marvel at the time? Well, I got fired off the book, so it didn't end the way I wanted it. But, um, <laughs> oh, wine, wine, wine. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, up to that point, I know it continued on, but I mean, I, I, I thought it was getting a little busy and a little messy. You and I talked about this, you know, yep. inside conversations, you know, for some of the reasons we said, and I think it was starting to get in that insular way, which if I continued on it. What was the, what was the, the issues? Was it more editorial? Was, was it sales? I know that was a crazy time at Marvel where they were pu pu publishing almost 500 books maybe or something like that. It's, I don't feel it was editorial. I mean, certainly there was a mandate to have a crossover a year or something like that, but mm -hmm. we still had, I think, a lot of flexibility to make it work, but I think we were still positioned, you know, in this world yeah. that was getting darker as opposed to this world that was maybe exploring things in a different way. And I think it spoke to a, a forced, um, a forced connection between yeah. some of the books, Yeah, as we said, you know, mm -hmm. where, where, you know, you know, thanks to Dan, we came up with with the Lilith idea, and I think that that was a really good, um, you know, start out of the gate. But then we realized some of these characters just didn't have anything right. to do with one another. I mean, this was a weird editorial mandate. I don't even know the exact reasons behind this, but one thing that's come up over the years is the Midnight Suns were the supernatural arm of the Marvel Universe, right? We couldn't use Doctor Strange. Right, we we had there's like one scene I think toward the end of uh, might have been the first Night Stalkers or something like that where he sort of shows up as a character, but then it became this you can't play with him. What, what yeah. was the logic behind that? Whoever had him, Ralph or somebody Ralph. at that point, didn't want him to play right. in this space. Did he even have his own book at that point? I don't know, but don't but you know, but that did. that was yeah. that was a weird thing. Why, if you're having this huge supernatural event, right. why don't you have the Sorcerer Supreme <coughs> being a big big part of it? Right. Right. Um, my other question is, do you ever get proud of seeing your stuff in some of the stuff you've done in other mediums? Like I'm thinking, like, I remember seeing Ghost Rider in the Fantastic Four cartoon, and I remember um, recently this video game called Midnight Sun, spelled S-U-N. Yeah. -S -S yeah, that was a way not to pay us any money. <laughs> but, 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 it has, but it has Lilith as a main character, and I was just wondering if you guys watch that and feel a little proud or... I, I know. I don't know. Pride seems <laughs> a little strong because sometimes it is. It's about oh look, they're using my character and not paying me any <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> any residuals for that. But I, I watched the um, uh, oh shoot, uh, Hellstrom um, TV series. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone saw. I, I saw it. You saw mm -hmm. the whole thing, and I you saw it. who the the. The villain would have Oh, I didn't watch been. the whole thing, no. Oh, no, no. well, if you okay. got to the end, mm -hmm. there's a little kid, and uh, if there was a second season, uh, it would have been uh, Lilith. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, All so, right. And that was kind of cool for me, and they and they used a different version of Did they thank us in the credits? Oh, no. No. Oh, no, no, no. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a complicated mix. Yes, sometimes you see things, and yeah, it's kind of cool. I was not a big fan of the, the Ghost Rider movies. Quite, quite, quite frankly, even though you know they used Johnny Blaze, but it was the the Dan Ketch version Ghost Rider design. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like there were some good elements to the movie that they they could have used an editor or or a consulting writer. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, so it it is complicated. Uh, it's a complicated experience when you've been working uh, uh, for corporate publishing. Uh, to to see the usage of the, the characters in other media. I really enjoyed seeing the Scarlet Spider in the new Spider-Verse movie, even though... I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> <laughs> and you're never going to see it. So. Uh, even though they made fun of him, really. They were making fun of what we were doing in the 90s in general and the approach to comics then. 
I enjoyed it nonetheless. I don't know about pride, how it's right, because it would have to be a almost direct translation of what we did with a character to feel that. And it never is. It's never that. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. So we nice see shirt. we see the shirt, so we know it's going to be a <laughs> good question. You know these questions. <laughs> it's definitely a ghostwriter question. <laughs> How much flack from the other writers or creative people did you do when you did bring Blaze back and made them brothers? Uh, yeah, if I got flack, I didn't listen. <laughs> it was uh, it was no. I mean, I don't know that there would have been. Are you, are you talking about from the other Midnight Suns writers or... or just or? anybody at Marvel in general. Like, uh, you guys were going down this path, you brought Blaze back, and then all of a sudden they're brothers, and yeah. it's like, bang, Dallas, you know, you Bobby know, woke up. Honestly, I, I hopefully everybody has a similar um, approach that I do, which is, again, when I'm, when I'm done with a, a, a character, you know, it's up to the next writer to do. I mean, a lot of things, from my understanding, happened to Ghost Rider even right after I left. Mm. Didn't read the stories, because not, not my character, quite frankly. Um, you know, even Danny Ketch, who I did co-create, um, still not mine, I know, I know what the deal is when, when you do that stuff. So that's part of the reason why I don't um, read <laughs> the character after I left, but I, I didn't really get anything, because quite frankly, I mean, look, it's comic books, everything mm. is, is undoable, <laughs> you know, including yeah. death. Yeah. Or brothers. <laughs> right, exactly. Or, or, you know, Mark DeMattis turning uh, uh, Moon Knight into a pacifist and me coming on there going, nah. <laughs> so, no, I didn't really get, get much flack. Uh, okay. Also, the great thing was back then, this, this thing, the series of tubes that runs under the earth and connects everybody called the internet didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if somebody really hated that, even including fandom, they had to actually take the time and write out a, uh, a missive and put it in a, an envelope and seal the envelope and get a stamp and find the address and send it in. And then you were never going to read it anyway. Oh, no, God. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you. Sure. And by the time they found a stamp... They were already not angry exactly. anymore. Yeah. The next issue came out and cleaned it all up. So I know that we're kind of at the end of our time and before, um, you know, before we finish and you know, we can let everybody know where you guys are the rest of the weekend and where you're sitting so they can come visit if they have any more questions. What are some of the characters or is there any particular character that you want to work with or really can say, you know what, my, my, I, I fulfilled the dream of writing or drawing this character, being a part of this character. Um, maybe not necessarily being like proud of how it began and ended, but did you go in with a character that you loved and got to write, draw, edit, do whatever you needed to do, be a part of that life? And if not, which character is it? I really always wanted to try Moon Knight. And so I was really happy to get that opportunity i was able to do different things with the character i was as i said earlier disappointed that i couldn't touch on the mental health issues because i thought that's really where the meat of the character's story would be mm -hmm. but i love being able to play in that sandbox mm -hmm. and i, I look I, I got to do ghost rider it's a huge fan of ghost rider i i had a nice long run which perhaps when i first did it went on a little bit too long. I think I, I should have stepped away uh, a year or two earlier, quite frankly. And, uh, and now I'm, I'm revisiting Ghost Rider right now in a mini series with, you know, completely new eyes. And, you know, I quite frankly, just because it's been almost 30 years, I'm a totally different writer than I was then. But then I also got to do Spider-Man, which was a yeah. lifelong dream. I got to write one small Batman story. Uh, but then my time at Marvel, because of the long run I had on Ghost Rider and Spider-Man, and then the number of stories Terry had me do uh, in the Marvel Comics uh, Presents book, uh, I got to touch upon just about every character in the Marvel Universe. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've written Daredevil stories and, and Doctor Strange stories and, you know, Cap and Iron Man and all that. So, I mean, I, I count myself very, yeah. very fortunate um, as a, you know, a recovering uh, comic uh, 
<laughs> geek <laughs> to to be able to exercise exercise no uh yeah experience, experience. all of those uh those those good thing you're a writer yeah thank god work, yeah that, that i need two editors to help me <laughs> and and actually to what howard said as the editor of marvel comics presents for five years which was four stories per issue mm -hmm. twice a month i got any character i ever had any interest in in the marvel universe i commissioned stories for yeah uh so that was a lot of fun for me i don't think i didn't I don't think there's a character out there I didn't touch that I wanted to. Well, that sounds creepy. Oh, yeah. Why did I say that? Dark side of the Marvel <laughs> Universe, you know. Well, I knew we'd creepy. get around to that. But I had their permission, so it's okay. Yeah. Good stuff. Oh, I guess my answer. Um, uh, you know, like Howard, like Terry, I had a chance to play with a lot of characters. And in the theme of our dark side, uh, there was a character I worked on called Terror Incorporated, which was sort of like a boogeyman mm. assassin, uh, which uh, is probably the closest personification of my personality, yeah. <laughs> at least according to Carl Potts. Um, it, it would be fun to kind of go back and play with that character again uh, in one capacity. I think we had a good run of it. It was a short run, but it was always one that was kind of fun to play with, and uh, that would be something that would be cool to go back to. It, it was funny you mentioned uh, JMD Mateus and following him up and things, and I got to interview him a few, when I was doing a comic podcast years ago, I got to interview him and we were talking about writing and my favorite story. And this guy was like, so just down to earth and chill. And I said, and he goes, I was telling him, cause I'm a huge war comics guy and I loved weird war tales. So you're talking about flaming skulls. That was every cover. Um, it was a skeleton in a German uniform. It was an American, whatever one it was, there was a skeleton. And he was always kind of the good guy on the cover, which was weird because he was doing the, it was just a weird thing. But we talked about, um, as a kid, I used to love the, the, I would read Weird War Tales. I would read House of Mystery or, or Time Warp. And then I would read any of these anthology books. And he said, I got to tell you a really funny story about how I ripped off DC for paying me for the same story. And I'm like, oh, I can't wait to hear this one. So he said, I wrote a Weird War Tales story, and it's Weird War Tales number 71. This is how bad I am with comics, um, where they found a um, floating PT boat. And they picked him up, and they picked up the survivor. It was the only officer that was left. And in five stories, he became a vampire and killed the entire crew. That was the end of the story. Um, and then he goes, did you read Time Warp? And I go, I love Time Warp. And he goes, well, issue number five has a spaceship that is derelict floating in space. And another ship came up and got in there. And guess what the, guess what the, uh, the guy was inside there? I'm like, vampire? And he goes, yep, killed the whole crew. And he goes, and then I wrote for, I think it was for House of Mystery. It was like a straight on vampire story. Like, oh yeah, this was an easy one. They bought a house, the vampire was in there and he killed the whole family. Um, but it's those funny stories like that where you, you know, and the creative side of things. And I was laughing so hard at that because again, I had every single one of those issues. I think I even brought them to have them sign. It, it's, it's those things that, that make me just love comic books. And, and when you get to talk to the creators and know those little stories, like you guys talking about sitting around a room and throwing ideas around, mm -hmm. um, those are the things that I love to hear. And I, I'm pretty sure everybody else likes to know that there was some heart and love and soul and maybe some stealing behind the scenes of our favorite comic book characters. So as we wind down, um, where are you guys sitting out in Artist Alley? So people can come find you and talk more. Howard. Me, Dan, uh, K, next to K each row. other, literally. The, row K. Yeah. Yes. Row K. I'm K4, C3, so and something like that. I don't, yeah. I we I don't K4. do math, but yes. K4. For K, right, K right in the middle. Yeah. 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 Or just follow the ray of sunshine and yes. wonder yeah. Yeah. Yes. and happiness. Exactly. Sure. Exactly. <laughs> Look for the unicorns. Who is that? Rainbows. <laughs> yeah. So thank you guys thank very you. much. Thank everybody thank for everybody. being here. A round of applause yeah. for our thank guests. You. Thank you. And enjoy the rest of the show. Hey, Southie! Oh.